I'm going to talk to you today about a project we built called MapGive. Uh, and as you'll see, we call it a coordinated campaign for action. So it combines many of the elements that you've just heard about, imagery, volunteer mapping, and what we've tried to do at State in terms of uh, building an outreach campaign and a social media strategy for bringing new mappers into the into the fold here. So not necessarily talking to the people in this room, talking to the people who sit outside who might be willing to come help and volunteer. But because that was such a really good description of what happened in the Philippines, I think it is interesting. I'd like to just talk a little bit about, um, you know, of course, disasters happen at the worst time, right? Not only was it a weekend, it was a three-day weekend in which uh, Veterans Day, so Washington, D.C., federal government was basically shut down. Um, and the reason why I think this story works so well, because uh, in fact, NGA's disaster group activated over the weekend and were able to, utilizing national technical means, figure out where the areas that were uh, impacted the worst and provide out publicly, or at least to uh, disaster response organizations, uh, damaged polygons while the cloud cover was still in effect. Um, and not only was it a weekend, um, it was my wife's birthday, so she and I were at the, at the beach um, taking routine three hour, every three hours uh, Blackberry break. Um, remote desktoped into my computer and started downloading imagery as soon as I could. Um, basically we had, as this thing will show, um, I forget which day this was, it was we were able to get the first commercial imagery tasked was made available on Monday. We had it ortho rectified and pan sharpened, downloaded, processed, repushed into our cloud infrastructure, tiled and served out Tuesday night uh, for Talk Laban post event and Ormoc City pre event. And the reason I bring that up is because Bing is hugely useful uh, for the pre event mapping, but there was a gap, and Ormoc City was a gap. Um, and so, uh, as far as I can tell, I think we had the first imagery that was up and available for use over a tiled map service. Um, Unisat and Copernicus had been able to, Copernicus is the EU group, um, remote sensing group, and Unisat is with the UN satellite group. They had been able to directly access the raw digital globe imagery. Um, the day before and produce those damage assessments. So you had NGA's damage assessments coming in and then you had Unisats and Copernicus's and then you had us being able to come in with data the next day. Um, and over the course of the week we provided imagery over northern Cebu Island. If you just kind of think about that track of, of, of how the cyclone passed through. And then ultimately later over uh, Carles, which is where I think the bulk of the damage assessment was done. Um, so in a sense this this is a while there's, we learned a lot, we got, I think we got a lot right. And on the USG side and the, in the operations with the interagency and with the response community, I think we did some things well there. So that's just a little bit about imagery of the crowd. I just wanted to, to go over that a bit. Um, basically, I work for a group called the Humanitarian Information Unit. And essentially our job is to do research and analysis of complex humanitarian emergencies. We're not really a disaster response agency. That's really USAID OFTA's job. Um, ours is a complex emergency, which is usually a, a bad protracted situation that is often complicated due to a natural disaster. So the, the lines get kind of fuzzy, but we try to keep them separated, uh, you know, more in terms of political violence or unstable uh, societies. So a lot of my thinking and our thinking about behind the HIU stems from a series of quotes um, that came out. Of, I give you the actual the citation here because I want you to know, note the date and the fact that it was published in a journal article. Uh, Bill Wood was uh, previously the geographer of the United States, geographer of the State Department. Uh, my current boss, Lee Schwartz, Bill Wood was his predecessor. And Bill had published several notions about the role of GIS in complex humanitarian emergencies that was informed coming out of Kosovo. So the late 90s, 2000s. So this idea that unfortunately maps are often taken for granted. And that's even more true today when we walk around with a smartphone in our pocket and we have every expectation and we just push a button and we know where we are and where everything is around us. Well it doesn't play like that in Goma, you know. So 
this notion that, that data oftentimes doesn't exist is important. Dale brought up a, a very good point about how OSM has become this dynamic fabric and this uh, information exchange, this other language. Bill's other points in this article was that the DACE map needed to be dynamic, it needed to be updatable, and it needed to be done before bad things happened. Right, and so that, that's kind of the philosophical underpinning of what imagery to the crowd began as and what MapGive became. So this is just some of the graphics for, for MapGive, um, at MapGive on, on Twitter, mapgive.state.gov. Um, and essentially what this is, is to say, all right, mapping's kind of hard. Like, it's kind of a high bar to figure out how to get into the OpenStreetMap community and how to give back uh, in a humanitarian emergency. But just as we've seen the rise of the ability to say text in $10 to the Red Cross or to another relief organization, our question was, what about folks who would, might want to do a little bit more? Can we teach them why mapping is important? Teach them how to map, give them tools so they can learn how to map for themselves and then get them directed to mapping tasks that we know will directly affect the provision of humanitarian assistance. And in this case, we often are all, through the imagery of the Crowd Project, we're also providing um, imagery, updated imagery over those areas. Um, I'm going to take a second and just show you, this is a three minute video that's on the website that is the why mapping is important and I think it does a, a better job than I can do um, explaining it. The sound may or may not work, so I'm going to, oh, sorry. In 2010, after an earthquake in Haiti, online volunteers became part of a movement that is creating a free and open digital map of the world. In an emergency, you just need data from wherever you have it. It's important that the information is open and available to everyone because some situations we don't know it's going to happen. It's a surprise. What is remote mapping? Remote mapping is sort of an interesting new phenomenon that's happened probably since about 2010 in Haiti. We saw a real push of volunteers coming online to help create map data where none existed before. Map data helps humanitarian efforts, not just in a crisis. It helps communities like Kibera in Nairobi, Kenya, prepare, develop, and respond to needs at the local level. It's a big job, and not every place is mapped like we may believe. Developing or establishing data is a very huge step in, in kicking off the process of, of changing things. And, and that's the point at which the maps become very useful. When the typhoon happened, we realized that there were no good maps of the Philippines, that there needed to be maps so that our personnel would know where to go and what they would find when they, when they got there. So we partnered with the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team um, to help them and help us build out a base map for the Philippines. Think of OpenStreetMap as Wikipedia for maps. OpenStreetMap is a free and open map of the entire world. Uh, it's primarily edited by volunteers. We create everything in the commons. It's completely open, available for anyone to contribute to and anyone to use. How do volunteers help? The way that a volunteer can help is by looking at satellite imagery and picking out different predefined objects and saying, OK, I see a house. I can trace the edges of that house. I see a road. I can trace the line of that road. I see an edge of a forest. I can trace the edge of that forest. MapGive is making it easier for new online volunteers to take those first steps in helping build an open, free map of the world and become digital humanitarians. Learn how to map in three steps. Get an OpenStreetMap account, practice mapping, then get connected with a task on the MapGive site. You'll get the skills to map. What you'll give helps communities around the world. The value of the geographic data created an open street map for humanitarian response has already been compelling. The amount of information that's been produced and the utility it has rendered to the humanitarian community is a game changer in humanitarian response. For the typhoon response, we've had, I think, almost 1,600 volunteers um, do something like 4.5 million edits to the, to the base map just for the Philippines. Um, and those 1,600 uh, volunteers represent some three to four years of dedicated mapping that one person would be able to do. We're asking the question, what if there were more online map givers? What can happen if we had 10 times the amount of volunteers, 50 times the amount of volunteers? How many areas could we map? How much good could we do in this process? 
Let's find out how much good we can do. Map Give today. Tell them, hey, mapping is an important thing, and that fa in fact, your work can can make a difference. Um, so let me step back. I will get to more of MapGive, but I want to step back to the philosophical bit just a little bit because a lot of the questions we get is why is why is the State Department interested in this? And I'd say, let's look at where we exist as a society today. This this paper by Tim O'Reilly um, in the early 2000s. Um, about the open source paradigm shift, it basically saying that the connective power of the internet has fundamentally changed the economics of knowledge production. Full stop. Whether that's open source software, whether that's Wikipedia, whether that's buying books or real estate, it is a different world we live in and it's a, it's a shift that measures on the order of magnitude of a paradigm shift as Kuhn described in the structure of scientific uh, revolutions. So we live in a different world. And it's not just about open source as software. What we've seen now is organizations have been born out of this new you know, milieu, enabled by open source software, enabled by new processes to be able to produce information. And OpenStreetMap is a perfect example of that. So as the State Department, as we look back and think, one of our strategic goals is to promote peace and prosperity and human security around the globe. How can we best do that and how can we engage with organizations in new ways to do that? Um, so when we looked at what happened in Haiti and the availability of imagery, commercial high resolution imagery formatted in a way that was easy for volunteers to be able to quickly tap into, bring into a mapping environment, yielded incredible results. So if you're to break this architecture down, if you're going to replicate what happened in Haiti, you've got you know, fancy words like terabytes and orthorectified and things that remote sensors understand. And over here, you've got a bunch of volunteers who are like, sure, I'd love to help if it's fast and easy. And oh, yeah, you've got to talk to them over the internet. So what we looked at as a government, if we were able to replicate uh, that process, what could we do? Could we essentially build a system from here back where utilizing a purchasing, our, our ability as the United States government to buy commercial unclassified satellite imagery, to buy that, process it, share it out in a way that volunteers could quickly and easily consume, it was kind of a field of dreams question. If we put the imagery out there, will they come map it? And basically we've done that about 15 times as, through imagery to the crowd. And um, the, I think the answer is yes. Um, and then map give was, what grew out of that in terms of saying like, okay, now we need to lower the bar for new people to come in. Um, but because, I also put this slide back in because of Robert's talk about, um, you know, crowdsourcing and government and, and what are we trying to actually do as the HAU, can we go out and start and build trust in these, in these communities, these technical communities, can we enable them, be a catalyst by being able to share imagery, we say next you licensed imagery, that's the name of the license under which we buy, the US government buys the imagery, and put that in a way where non-USG organizations can build up the base map data, and that's kind of the remote mapper question, right? People can connect in, map, create the data, but no satellite image will tell you the name of the road, tell you the name of the built, the you know the business that's in that building. So now you get to this step: How do you take that bucket of geometries and go engage the local communities and give them the skills to be able to update that map data and use it for themselves? And can we kick off this virtuous cycle um, by building this infrastructure and serving out the imagery? So obviously, as Dale said. We can't do any of this without HOT. I mean, as a, the government, we have limited reach. We need a partner, um, a nonprofit like HOT structure um, and their volunteer structure um, is, the, is a perfect partnership for us. They can help us in terms of determining what the humanitarian requirements are and where imagery is needed, help with volunteer coordination, provide access to the tasking manager. Um, so as the government, all we're trying to do is be a catalyst. Right? Can we help drive an existing effort through the provision of, of satellite imagery and now through MapGive through the provision of this additional information and outreach campaign to bring new people into the process? So this is the map of where we did imagery to the crowds. Um, you can see that most of them are clustered in, in Central and East Africa. Um, 
Just a couple quick results. This was in the Democratic Republic of Congo, a city called Kindu, which there's about 400,000 internally displaced uh, people in this province. UN OCHA is ramping up their humanitarian logistics out in this part of DRC. This is what Kindu looked like before we started. That's at the same scale, 66 days or 50 days later. We zoom in a little bit, you start to see the kind of incredible results that come out of that. Um, and I would say, you know, this was done by 66 people in 52 days. Those 52 days were sandwiched between the typhoon response and the start of the violence in CAR in South Sudan. So it's not like there wasn't other stuff going on and this was still able to be accomplished. And keep in mind, we have a, as we're moving forward with MapGive, we have a broader strategy related to this area of DRC and some of the mapping tasks we have up now uh, piggyback on this logistics rollout that OCHA wants to make. So we had built this website where we were trying to be you know, transparent in what we were doing to make sure people could have access to it. But we're not communications experts. We're geo people and, and analysts. So we teamed up with another group at State Department, the Office of Innovative Engagement. The good thing about State is, it is its public diplomacy wing is very smart. They understand social media. They understand communications and outreach. So we tried to work together in this process. So what came out of it was the MapGive site. Um, the site itself, technically, it's Section 508 compliant, which is American with Disabilities Act um, compliance. It is all in responsive CSS, so it'll work on any device. And all the code is up in GitHub. If anybody wants it, I'll give you the repo uh, later in the presentation. And so essentially what it's designed to do is be an explanatory layer about humanitarian mapping. So you come in, why map? You'll see the video I just showed you is embedded there. Um, what is open mapping? Who are the organizations in involved? Um, and then the other key piece and the value of working with the Office of Innovative Engagement, there's a team of eight people that had never mapped before. So they were the perfect focus group to say, all right, go get an OpenStreetMap account, figure out how to do this. And through that process in over six months, we built out these two training videos based primarily on their the, the road bumps that they hit in the process. And so the first one teaches you how to map an open street map. Um, and then the second one is um, how to utilize the OSM tasking manager. And then the third bit is down here, which is if you're interested in, in mapping a in a task that we know we have vetted the humanitarian requirement for, you can get access to it right there. That'll take you to, the, I just pulled the screenshot this morning. This is the first mapping task over in the Mule, South Sudan. Um, the humanitarian crisis in South Sudan is just continues to be awful. Um, this town sits right on the border of Uganda and South Sudan, right along a major logistical highway that the U.S. government has spent hundreds of millions of dollars constructing, and it was essentially nothing in the database. And so, we're almost done. We're almost done with this one. Um, and this again has been in the context of the Ebola mapping and the amazing amount of work that's been done in regards to that and then the crowdsourcing search for the Malaysian Airlines. So a good amount of work has gotten done when there's been some very high profile events going on. Um, right now we have uh, a couple other tasks including three in DRC which are part of that, um, part of that logistical rollout that UNOCHA had. And so this isn't all states doing. Um, we've also, there's a thing called, a program called the Presidential Innovation Fellowship, and it's a fairly high profile program run out of the White House, and they're going into round three. We were able to get a topic included in that um, called Open Street Map for Diplomacy. So we're going to be able to bring in um, a PIF fellow starting this summer to work specifically to continue the engagement. Um, related around MapGive and to increase the usage of OpenStreetMap inside the State Department. So I'm very excited about someone that will um, be able to come in and focus on that directly. We've started to do some outreach events. Um, we had a small mapping party um, at George Mason University uh, two weeks ago and then we're uh, there's going to be another one this next weekend at the University of Kansas. We're working with a, a group called America View, which is a USGS uh, consortium of research universities. So we hope to continue to push the, you know, the mapping party into the ground games uh, side of this. And then also, I, I don't know if we'll be able to do this or not, but as U.S. taxpayers, we pay for these things called American spaces. We, the State Department has 800 locations around the world, oftentimes with computers, um, in, usually in libraries or other civic facilities, where we do outreach. 
through, you know, it's usually embassy staff that will be doing something about, that might be teaching a class on math and science or doing some sort of outreach with the local community. Uh, one of my hopes is that the PIF will be able to build curriculum that people will be able to use to take two posts, identify areas in their country, host mapping parties, and try to get that other phase of the virtuous cycle completed. How do we go from buckets of geometry to actual places in OpenStreetMap? Um, there's a couple things in here I wanted to mention. Um, this is the GitHub account. This first one, if you're interested in the site at all, that's MapGiv. But for folks who have been on the hot list serve in the last couple of weeks, there's been talk about uh, an image request tool, um, potentially building one of those. We actually had one built about a year and a half ago, and we've been so busy we haven't been able to deploy it. And when I say we, I mean me and my colleague Patrick. Patrick, are you in here? Yeah, in the back. Um, I stand up here and bump my gums. Patrick makes things happen, so um, <laughs> that's, why, that's why the request tool isn't deployed yet. However, if it would be of any utility to HOT, you're certainly willing to, to have it. It's a Django app built with uh, Open Geo Suite components. Um, and that should also hope facilitate uh, additional image requests into us because it'll be structured and formatted in a way that, that we could use. Um, and also this like heart bleed thing kind of took our website down for five or six days. It's still not up. So um, the other news that I wanted to make sure this community knew were the guidelines for how you request imagery to be shared from the US government if you're an NGO, whether that be like you can actually use the imagery yourself or through imagery to the crowd to make a request so that we could actually host and be able to uh, provide that out through the tasking manager. I tried to shorten the link so it can just be um, very simple if you wanted to write it down. This will actually take you to a web page on humanrights.gov um, where these have been published and then as soon as we get our website back and the ability to edit it, um, we'll make sure that the documents are available at hiu.state.gov. Um, this has been something that I don't think we've done the best job at in terms of communicating to the humanitarian world how to ask us for help. Um, and so hopefully we can begin to get better at that and uh, this is a start at least. And then I would just ask, you know, push this out through your social networks. Um, the other bit of this was we built a social media outreach campaign and State Department has across like 500 social media properties has about 30 million fans and followers. So we're going to continue to try to roll out MapGive through those channels um, and I would just ask for your support and help. Um, check out MapGive, send it on to your friends. The ho hope is that people who don't don't have to be GIS uh, you know, experts, can quickly be able to learn and contribute. And with that, I say thank you, and happy to take some questions.